Welcome to this little conference this evening, which will deal on small virtue in the whole structure of the Christian life. Small in the sense that it is not one of the major virtues, but on the other hand, it is a major virtue overall. It's a question of obedience. When I say small, understand, I'm compared to faith, hope, and charity. It's not one of the theological virtues. It's not one of the cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. It is part of the virtue of justice. So it is, uh, we say, a daughter of justice. So a few words of just introduction to situate the difficulties of this virtue. And I would start with St. Pius X. St. Pius X, in his encyclical on catechism, Acerbo Nimis, in 1905, St. Pius X, at the very beginning of the encyclical, he sees that there is a lot of evils in the world, lots of problems, and he says, I agree with those who say that the cause of all the evils in the world, the number one cause, is ignorance of things divine. Ignorance. And I have to say today, even among traditional Catholics, among good, even practicing Catholic, conservative Catholics, there's a lot of ignorance of the Christian life, of grace, the role of grace, of the sacraments, what are the virtues, the different degrees, like the uh, purgative way, the illuminative way, the unitive way, what the structure of religious life. There's a lot of ignorance. And we have unfortunately fallen under one of the major, one of the major aspects of modernism, which is to replace faith by feeling. Religion has become very much a question of feeling, of emotions. And in this issue with the traditional mass, uh, we have to say, well, feeling exists, but feeling is not faith. And we must be guided by faith, by objective truth, not by just religious sentiment. Obedience is not one of the top seven virtues, as we have just said. Nevertheless, it is a real major virtue by its, uh, the role that it plays in the whole religious life, the whole spiritual life. So much that Saint Thomas, well, the Church has these, these three vows, the three evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And obedience is really the, the greatest of the three vows, or the three evangelical council, because poverty handles material goods, chastity handles our body, but obedience deals with our will, and that's the most difficult. And that's the, the, the root of all our sanctification is, do you want to, you know, to be perfect? So obedience is a major virtue in the spiritual life. It's a major virtue in our Catholic life. After the French Revolution, say from 1830, with Pope uh, 1831, Pope Gregory XVI, until Pope Pius XII in 1958, when he died. We have a series of really great popes who had to deal with modern errors, and they wrote these great encyclicals on communism, on rationalism, on modern errors, modernism, liberalism, whatever. And they were demanding obedience. He says, the enemies are getting organized around the church, we need to be really working closely together and, and you need to obey Rome. You need to obey the Pope. And St. Pius X, you read some of the things he wrote, he said, whoa, what would he say today? Because uh, it's not just matters of dogma, it's a matters of whatever, uh, practically, whatever the Pope says, you better obey. 
if you want to stay in the ship. And uh, because we had good Pope and he was a saint. Of course, he could demand and he was there as the, at the elm of the ship. So obedience has played and it, a tremendous uh, role and it plays an important role in our faith. In our faith, when you read the encyclicals of the Pope, it is clear they want us to follow the teaching. But we have to understand that obedience, obviously, is not used only in the church. Obedience is used everywhere, in sport, in arts, in music, in, in politics, in, in the army, in, uh, in school, in teaching, everywhere, in all the sciences, in all the fields of knowledge, where there's an organization, in business, you have to follow rules. And if you want to stay with the, the group. And so, and that is, somebody will give orders and others have to obey. It's, it's everywhere. And that's very important. Because that will tell us that obedience is really, we're, we're going to come to this in a moment, obedience is going to be really an instrument, like a knife, that can be used to cut your stake or that can be used to kill somebody. So it's going to be an instrument, it's going to be an attitude of the soul, which in itself will neither be good or bad. We'll, we'll explain that in a moment. Because we see the communists using obedience, see that in communist countries, we see doctors performing abortion, ordering the nurses to help them perform the abortion, or else you lose your job. Teachers have to teach all these, these modern courses, these, these evil courses, or else they lose their job. Is that obedience? Okay, so we see, this is the introduction. I'm just trying to situate the problem. The problem is complex, and it's not enough to say, oh, I just want to obey. And that's not an answer. That's not a, a sufficient answer. And lastly, last point of my little introduction is obedience is a, it's a major issue today, today in 2017, but it's been very much since in the last, uh, last 55, 60 years, since Vatican II, because all the, the teaching of, the, of Vatican II, all the the reforms of Vatican at all levels, in the religious communities, in the, the teaching, in the seminaries, in the, the discipline, in architecture, in art, in, in, the, in uh, the liturgy, of course, in the chant, in everything has been done in the name of obedience. And so, and we see the fruits. So, and there's been, uh, there's been an abuse of that word obedience. And of course, we think Catholic, we react Catholic, and we want to be good. So we hear, well, we have to be obedient. So obedience is a good thing, so let's obey. But now we, we have seen an abuse of that name, that word obedience, that reality. When you have, for example, Pope Paul VI in May 1976, May 24th, who says, in the name of tradition... We order all the communities, all the parishes, to accept the reform liturgical rite. So in the name of tradition, we must accept the new Mass. So, obedience? So or we have to receive communion in the hand. So, what? So, obedience is, is a complex issue. So let's... In the first part, let's look at the, uh, the virtue of obedience. Or even before, yeah, the virtue of obedience. Because it is a virtue. It's not because somebody abuses it that it's no longer a virtue. But what you have to understand is, obedience, first of all, obedience is simply, the most simple expression of obedience is to do someone else's will. Pick up your shoes or, or go to mass or, you know, do your homework. That's obedience. So it's to do someone else's will. 
So I don't decide. Someone else tells me what to do and I, I submit to that direction. And that's all it is. The, the dog will be obedient. You say, go to your corner, sit down, stand or go get the ball. OK, the dog learns obedient, learns instinct to react to an order. So if we start there, obedience is neither good nor bad. It's simply to do someone else's will. And that is that is something to, to understand. Uh, now, if I have to do someone else's will, that means there's two people. Because I don't obey myself. I have to obey someone else. So there's going to be another person, an authority, or somebody who claims an authority. Well, let's not use the word right away, but well, we can use it. Somebody will tell me what to do. So we, let's call this the lawful superior. Somebody who has received an authority over me. It can be the parents have authority over the children, uh, the bishop over the diocese, the pope over the whole church, the general of the army over the army. So once we are put in a position, a lawful position, then we have lawful authority over those under me, under us. So that's pretty, that's common sense. So there's going to be the lawful superior who will have jurisdiction, who will have the right to give orders over certain people. That's what we call jurisdiction. And there will be, so first there's, there's the position, if you want, and then there's going to be the, the execution of that position. So the superior, the policeman or the teacher will give orders. And so we call this lawful order. So there's going to be a lawful superior, and we're speaking about good obedience here, a lawful superior who is giving a lawful order. I'm entitled to ask you this. Please do it. That's my right to ask you. I'm your teacher. I want you to do this homework for tomorrow morning. Your parents put you here in the classroom. You do what I'm telling you. That's my order. And, and he's entitled to. So, so that we have to consider. We have to consider that if you, I may use the, the image of you want, horizontally and vertically. Horizontally, by this I mean only God has authority over absolutely everything. Everyone who has an authority, you work in an office, you work in a, in a classroom or whatever, in your kitchen, you, you, you have a certain domain which is quite clearly delimited and that's it you don't have you know you cannot tell the neighbor how to organize their house just because you're here you have authority over your house you don't have authority over the neighbor's house that's not your domain so that's what i mean by horizontally is someone else next to you has another domain and you don't have authority over that person only god has authority over absolutely everybody but by receiving any authority at any level, we have a limited domain. So that's what I would call the, the horizontal one. Like a judge here in Canada cannot issue a sentence for somebody who's in the US. It's a different territory. Okay? That's, we have to keep that in mind. It's very, very important. What I call vertically is obviously when God delegates, he's going to like delegate at there's going to be different levels. It's going to be the king if you want, and it's going to be the, the, the governors of the province, it's going to be the mayor of the city, there's going to be the, the policeman of the, the district, whatever it is going to be, and the father of the house. There's going to be different levels. So that's what we call, if you want, vertically. But nobody will have, or everyone has the duty to everyone to, to submit to the higher level. 
we all have, everybody has somebody above except God. So that's the vertical, vertical uh, approach to it. And a, a simple example, well, simple, it's a historical one, it's a famous one, St. Maurice. St. Maurice, whose feast is on September 22nd. St. Maurice was a, a, uh, the general of the Roman, the Theban Legion. Legion. And anyway, they were there crossing Switzerland, 6,000 men. They were the best soldiers. They had won all the battles in Germany and in Europe, and they're coming back to Rome. And the emperor, for whom they had fought, they had fought for the Roman Empire, we're talking about the year 250, thereabout. The emperor, finding that in the valley where they were, there were some Christians, and suspecting that, I don't know why he suspected it then, but you know, that's what happened, that Morris and his men were Christians, he wanted them to offer a sacrifice to Jupiter and to go and arrest the Christians. And they were his, his best soldiers. They were the number one legion of the whole Roman army. And Morris... I summarize the story. Maurice said, no. Emperor, we have fought for you. We have, we're willing to die. We, almost, we risk our life for you. And we will continue to do it for the empire. But we are Christians. And you cannot ask us something that goes against our religion. Because God is above the empire. And above you, sir. Okay? And so he respected the lawful, his lawful superior. But he considered rightly, that to offer a sacrifice to Jupiter was not a lawful order because it was going against a higher order. So the, the vertical element is, is very important when we speak about obedience. So, the, the, so two aspects, because St. Thomas Aquinas will explain, will, will ask the question, can we disobey? Or can we Rather, should, maybe should it, I forgot, I don't have the word right here, but can we not obey? Are we entitled sometimes not to obey an order that comes from someone else? And the answer will be these two points. Is he your lawful superior? If he's not your lawful superior, you're not obliged to obey. And secondly, is he asking you a lawful order? If he's asking you something sinful, the mother who sends her girl to prostitution to bring money in, the girl has to say, no, you are my mother, I respect you, but you're asking me something wrong. I cannot do that. So obedience has to consider these two things. Is it my lawful superior and is it a lawful order? So does he have jurisdiction over me? And is what he, is, he or she is asking is it in line with the higher orders? Ultimately, God, ultimately the faith, ultimately the teaching of the church. Okay? That is essential that in, in the question of obedience. Another aspect of this obedience is this uh, approach to all the virtues, which we, we study in, in St. Thomas and uh, in the classic writers that a truth and a virtue is always a summit between two opposite errors. Simple example, God exists, that's the truth. Well, there's an error by defect, there's no God. And there's an error by excess, there are many gods. But the, the truth is a summit between two opposite errors, one by defect and one by excess. If we take faith, or the, the, the virtue of faith is, you know, to, to believe, to give our supernatural faith, is to accept the truth revealed by God and proposed by the church. That's faith. A lack of faith, so error by defect, well, it's a lack of faith, it's a, to refuse to believe, unbelief. But there can also be an error by excess, which is to believe anything and anybody who pretends to be talking in the name of God. And so we would call the error by defect incredulity, somebody who does not want to believe. And 
theory by excess, credulity, somebody who just swallows everything. You know, and so there's, there's uh, whatever, anything with science fiction and anything, uh, superstition, horoscopes, fortune tellers, whatever. Faith is, no, faith is, I believe the one who is entitled to talk to me, tell me the truth in the name of God, and who cannot deceive nor be deceived. So, so if we apply this to obedience, so there's going to be the principle Truth, like virtue, is always a summit between two opposite. So true obedience will be to submit to the lawful orders of my lawful superiors who are all the way on line with Almighty God. That will be true obedience. There will be an error by defect, a lack of obedience. So it will be um, disobedience. I don't recognize my lawful superior. Or I don't accept his lawful order. I, I am my own boss, or I, I refuse obedience. Uh, when it is either by right or in practice, or there can also be an error by excess. To think that by simply submitting to the will of another, I am obedient, virtuously, meritoriously obedient. That's an error, because as we said earlier on, the order that I receive, maybe it comes from the wrong person who has no authority over me, or it goes against a higher order. And therefore, he is not entitled to give me that order. And we had one of our girls studying medicine some years ago, who was, she was in her finals after seven years of studying medicine in, in a French uh, uh, medical school. And a few months before the last exam, the doctor calls her one night and she walks in, in the emergency room and she had to perform an abortion. And it was on purpose. And she stood at the door and she froze like she says, oh, it's an abortion. And the doctor says, come on, hurry up. She's bleeding. Come, give me this, hand me this. And she just wouldn't move. And then the doctor turned around. I mean, he kind of pulled the mask and he said, whatever, Mary, if you don't help me now, you will fail your exam in June. She slammed the door. She walked away and she failed the exam. Okay. But and she was strong. She was able to say no. But would that have been an act of virtue to obey at the risk of, she's been studying for seven years to become a doctor, and this doctor is her head professor who's going to sign the certificate, and he says, you don't help me now, you're not passing the exam. She, and so it's, it's an abuse of authority. So authority, on the part of the one who has authority, is something we have to use as well according to the limits that we are given by the one who gave us the authority. And unfortunately, today there's a lot of abuse of authority. So, I mentioned doctors, I mentioned in the army, I mentioned, I mentioned in, in so many, in, in, in teaching, today especially with all the, 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 the evil courses that we have, it's not enough to claim, well, I have to do it or else I lose my job. When we die, we have to appear before God, He's going to ask us, did you do my will? Did you follow my commandments? So, it is fundamental because if we, if we apply this now to the crisis in the church that we see today, it is a crisis of obedience. We can call it a different thing. We can, it is a crisis of obedience and it is a crisis of authority as well because they're related, as we have said. There's no obedience without authority. And if you have authority, you have authority, that means a certain power, a certain responsibility over someone else, and that someone else must submit to you. So there's obedience. So it's a relation issue. And it can be a problem on both ends. Either somebody who manages badly his authority, but there can be an error by excess, an excess of authority. 
because we have authority, we may think that we have absolute power, absolute authority. And therefore, we don't have, we're not accountable to a higher up, which is false. Which is false. Only God has no one above him. Everyone else, remember in the parable, uh, the, uh, the unfaithful steward, the master says, give an account of your administration. And we all have to give an account of administration. Parents will be, in, will be asked, how did you raise your kids? And, uh, and so on. So, when we speak of obedience, and when we speak of the crisis of obedience in the church today, it's immediately, intrinsically related to a crisis of authority. It goes together. Because if the one who has the authority does not use his authority well, well, the one who obeys will have a problem. So, obedience is one of the, as we have said, in its proper place, one of the greatest, one of the greatest virtue by its fruits. And I hope so many saints, all these religious, I mean, the hundreds of thousands of religious monks and nuns, they made a vows of poverty, chastity, obedience. And they became tremendous saints. Nevertheless, but... Because of that, I should say, because obedience is such a, truly, a Catholic virtue, that the enemies of the church have understood that if they can break through that, uh, that wall protecting the church, the wall of, precisely, of the discipline of the church, if they can get inside and get a hold of the control tower and use that whole structure in the church, structure in the mind of the people that, well, to go to heaven I have to be obedient. That whole mindset, but the enemies of the church, and it's, it's, I'm not inventing it, I'll give you a quote in a moment, they had a plan way back, I mean, we're talking about 200 years practically, to, to infiltrate the church, get a hold of the commands, uh, the control tower, and, and use the whole structure of the church to shift the church in a direction opposite to its purpose, really. Instead of saving souls, it's going to lead souls to, to perdition. And we have to say that this is what has happened with Vatican II. Let me give you just a quote, first of all. A quote from a little booklet published by John Venari. Uh, he's not the one who, he just translated it. Actually, it came from Germany. But uh, it came from France. It was discovered in France back in the 18, uh, 1840s, I think, by a French historian. It's called the Alta Vendita. The permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita. Alta Vendita is, is the name of a Masonic group in Italy. So permanent instruction, meaning that's their, their, their mission, their, their plan of action. Basically, they give here the blueprint of how to destroy the Catholic Church. And they say... You know, go to the boys' school. Some of them will become priests. Some of them will become bishops. It will take generations. But in our ranks, the soldiers die, but the battle continues. You know, so that's their, their approach. But uh, what I, want, I want to quote this because they knew exactly. They know the strength of the Catholic. But here they use the strength and turn it around and made a weakness out of it. Well, they speak about shaping a generation for a pope that they're looking for. The, the ring. To assure ourselves a pope of the required dimensions, it is a question first of shaping for this pope a generation worthy of the rank we are dreaming of. So go to the youth, even to the children. And then uh, he speaks about the bishops, the priests, the bishops. 
And one day, they will form the Sovereign's Council. They will be called to choose a pontiff who should reign. And this pontiff, like most of his contemporaries, will be necessarily more or less imbued with the revolutionary Italian and humanitarian principles that we are going to begin to put into circulation. This is 1830. You want to revolutionize Italy? Look for the Pope whose portrait we have just drawn. Let the clergy march under your standard, always believing that they are marching under the banner of the apostolic keys. So, see, what that means is that either we're talking to the clergy, the priests, and the bishops. Just obey. Obey, believing that, well, he's the Pope, we obey, we obey, obey, obey. Throw, lay your nets, your snares, in the sacristies, the seminaries, in the monasteries. The fisher of fish, he makes allusion to, St. Peter, became the fisher of men, and you will bring friends around the apostolic chair. You will have preached a revolution in Tiara and in Cope, marching with the cross and the banner. A revolution that will need to be only a little bit urged on to set fire to the four corners of the world. It's frightening words. They said, we need to get to... He said, we don't want the Pope. They say, the Pope will not need to become even Freemason. But as long as he has the ideas and, and uh, people will follow because Catholics obey the Pope. The, question, the key is obedience. The gear is obedience. And what they have said in 1830, in the 1970s, 1977, I think, Archbishop Lefebvre, in a little booklet, a little article, he called that Satan's master stroke. To succeed greatly, not absolutely, of course, but to su succeed greatly in destroying the Catholic Church in the name of obedience. Why did priests give up their cassock? Well, we have to obey the bishop. He also asked us to do so. Why did the nuns start cutting their habits, removing their veils, and, and taking worldly dress? Well, because that's what the community decided. We have to obey. And why do you have to take communion in the hand? Well, that's what the bishop says. And then they said you're disobedient if you don't do what they say. You know, they're, they're really abusing. They have, in many, many times, abused authority. So... Let's come to some more practical issues, application of these things. I mentioned already 1976. Now I just mentioned 1977. At that time, Archbishop Lefebvre was in a tight discussion with Pope Paul VI. And we can say that the, the main issue is, well, there, there was one moment when it was the Archbishop of Lefebvre was September 1976, I think September 11, Archbishop of Lefebvre finally got a possibility to meet Paul VI. And he's there in front of the Pope. And the Archbishop explains to the Pope that he has a big problem of conscience because in a very, you know, diplomatic way, the Archbishop says to the Pope, he says, if I do what you ask me to do, which means take the new Mass and the reforms of Vatican II, I have to disobey all the Popes before you, who not only ordered a number of things, how to keep the faith, but threatened, if you don't do this, you'll be condemned. So, if I obey them, then I cannot obey you. The problem is Vatican II is changing the faith, and, and there's a conflict. So, if we apply what we said earlier on, who is the lawful superior, and what is the lawful order? Paul VI reply to that he says oh this is not time to do theology here 
Okay. And Paul VI, when you read a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, his allocutions and his, his uh, writings in his seven, mid seventies, Paul VI, it, it, when we speak about a crisis of authority, we're really there. He was taking everything personally. He was, I am the Pope. Obey what I say. Rather than like the other popes, he says, I am the Pope, in charge of keeping tradition. And I'm sorry, this is the faith. You just have to submit to this. It's not me. It's the church. And so, so there was a misconception even of the authority of the Pope. The Pope is not God. The Pope is the lieutenant of God. He receives the deposit of faith. The Vatican I says in one of the texts, uh, Pastor Eternus, I think, the Holy Ghost has not been promised to the successor of Peter to make new doctrines, but to protect, to explain, to defend the, the deposit of faith in, in a holy manner. So the Pope is only the guardian. He does not create the faith. And here, when, when Paul VI saw that Archbishop Lefebvre did not want to obey, he took that personally, whilst Archbishop Lefebvre says, I am obeying, but all your predecessors who came before you, you're number 264 pope. There's other popes who came before you, and they have established the faith. So there was a problem of, of, a, of the problem of words. As I said a moment ago, Paul VI says, in the name of tradition, take the new mass. I said, but the new mass is against tradition. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you, take the new mass. I am tradition. In the name of tradition, take the new mass. I said, well, how do you obey this? They, they, they're playing with words to confuse. So Archbishop Lefebvre says, no, I'm sorry, we can't. We can't. Just, words are not enough here. You need to, you need to look at, like, at uh, what has been done before. I don't know if you have heard of St. Vincent of Lérins. He's a monk in the 430, they're about in the south of France. He's the one who gave a, a golden rule for the faith as well, where he says, you know, I, I summarize a little bit because it's a bit of a long text, but he says, what, what to do? What is a Catholic supposed to do if there's confusion in the church? And if there's a major confusion, he says, well, then you look at the past. Because the past cannot change. The texts are there. The documents are there. The, the, dog, the, 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 the councils are there. The decisions have been taken. That cannot change. And that is what Archbishop Lefebvre did. Because there was confusion. And the confusion was, what do we do if the church of today goes against the church of yesterday? That's the, the key of the problem. So, Archbishop Lefebvre refused in 1975 to close his seminary. He was ordered to close his seminary in May 75. He says, no. The bishop is my lawful superior, yes, the bishop of Fribourg, but the order he's given is not a lawful order because there's a rule in the church that says a bishop can approve a new religious community in his diocese, but once he has approved it, he cannot suppress it. It has to be Rome that suppresses it. The reason, it's a reason of prudence. If I'm the bishop of Calgary, I approve a religious community, I die, another bishop comes, he says, oh, I don't like them, go away. And they have to leave. They've just bought a house, whatever. A third bishop comes in, no, come back, we'll start again. So to avoid these uh, kind of up and down, the church, the Pope have told the bishops, be careful, if you approve a religious community, you can let them in, but you cannot let them out. So, and the Bishop of Fribourg, by suppressing the society in 1975, went against that rule. His predecessor approved it, but he can no longer suppress it. So the Archbishop says, I'm sorry, he's not following the rules. There are higher rules in the church. 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre was ordered not to ordain the priests. 
or to ordain the priests with the new mass for the new mass, but not to ordain priests who say only the traditional mass. And Archbishop Lefebvre said, that is not a lawful order because it goes against the order of Pope St. Pius V vertically. Pope St. Pius V, who Archbishop Lefebvre says, canonized the old mass, in other words, put it in, a, in such a structure, such a, a legal uh, bind that nobody until the end of the world can change this. This is a Catholic mass. Nobody can be censured, punished for saying this mass. And in 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre was punished for insisting in ordaining priests who would say this mass. So he says, this goes against Pius V. It goes against a higher order. Because you might say, well, Paul VI is Pope, Pius V is Pope. Okay, but the authority with which Pius V, the authority he put on the document Quo Primum, is at a different level. It's much higher power, much more binding than the authority that Paul VI put to the new mass and to the, the laws around the new mass. They're, they're different levels. Although they're popes, yes, but the uh, pope can do documents at different degrees of authority. An encyclical, a document ex cathedra, a canonization, and so on. So, 1976, Archbishop Lefebvre was, quote-unquote, suspended at Divinis, which meant he was forbidden to say Mass, give confirmation, give ordination, although he was still in the church. He says that suspension is not valid because it goes against a higher order which says you have to save the faith, save your souls, save souls. And, and these are the laws to save souls. In the church, you have, there's different degrees of laws. There's, there's what, 3,000 laws in the church. There's some minor ones and there's some major ones. Minor one, Eucharistic fasting. You should not eat, say, one hour before, before receiving Holy Communion. That's the law of the church. But if you're in the hospital, you're sick, or you're diabetes, or whatever, and you have to take medicine, does that mean you won't be able to go to Communion anymore because you have to eat during the Mass? I've seen even priests eating pills while he's saying Mass because he had to. So medicine is not considered food. Because we need Holy Communion. We need the Mass. We need the sacrament. So the need of the sacrament is more important than the need of Eucharistic fasting. So Archbishop Lefebvre said, no, we, uh, I am being asked to take the new Mass, which was only a permission to say Mass in a different way than the traditional Mass, which Pope uh, Benedict XVI also confirmed in 2007 with the motu proprio when he said that the, the, the old mass was never abrogated. So Archbishop Lefebvre was suspended for refusing to say the new mass. That's really the bottom line. And he said, well, yes, he's, my, he's the pope, but the order is not a lawful order. I'm not bound to obey this. He's abusing his authority. He has no right to do that, even if he's the pope. Even if I respect him and recognize him as the pope, He's asking me something which is beyond, we might say, his jurisdiction, beyond his, his power to do so. So the Archbishop continued, and we come to 1988. The issue was the same. Accept Vatican II and the new Mass. It was the same. And, uh, but just before that, there was the question of 1986. There was the meeting of all the religions in Assisi, in Italy where Pope John Paul II invited representative of the 13, quote-unquote, great religions in the world to pray God, quote-unquote, because we don't know which God they're praying, for peace in the world. And uh, abomination. It's, it was against the first commandment. It was one of the saddest days, really, in, the, uh, in the, this, this century, really, this, this the Pope asking... Offering Buddhists, and it's all on film, and there's witnesses, there's pictures, journalists, whatever. It, it was public. 
Buddhist, they say you can go and say your prayers in that church over there. There was a church called St. Peter Church in Assisi. And they removed the Blessed Sacrament, thanks be to God, but they put a statue of Buddha on the tabernacle, and the monk is there incensing the statue of Buddha. At the request of the Pope. So, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a tremendous abuse here of authority. Uh, the Pope has no right to encourage somebody to worship false gods. That's beyond his, 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 his jurisdiction. He cannot do that. He's there to lead people to God. So there was that meeting, Archbishop Lefebvre said, no, they, this, is, this is really a, a blasphemy against the first commandment. But then he wrote a document saying, listen, you're changing the faith. And they said, well, we know it's new, but we're not going to change. We're continuing. There was a document early in 1987. And the Archbishop said, okay, you're not going to change. I tried everything to convince you you're on the wrong track. Okay, that's your decision. Well, I'm not going to change either. I'm getting old. I have 200 seminarians. I need to ordain some priests. And so I need to ordain them priests. Therefore, well, since Rome does not realize it's in the cul-de-sac, it's heading for a total disaster. I'm going to make some bishops in order to save the faith because young men don't know where to go to study in the seminaries. People are asking priests all over the world, asking for priests who will help them save their souls. And Rome is not waking up. So the archbishop tried to get permission from Rome. He got permission to have one bishop, although they refused the date, they refused the candidate, they refused... Uh, it was a real tug of war. The archbishop said, okay, the state of necessity, we need to come to the rescue of souls because like we have right here, I mean, Quebec, not far away, you know, all the seminaries are practically closed. There's, for the whole of Quebec, there's, I think, 20 seminarians this year. There used to be maybe 200 50 years ago or more than that. Vocations, families, schools, the Archbishop says, no, people need the sacraments and uh, young men want to be trained. They have nowhere to go. And so, and our society has been approved by the church, 1970, to make priests. And if the church approves an organization to have priests, well, it approves the means to make the priests. And that is the bishops. So, in the approbation of SSPX on November 1st, 1970, there is implicitly the approbation of having bishops who will provide the ordinations. So we're not going against the, the, the mens, the, the mind of the church. Archbishop Lefebvre was not going against by having bishops, not to have jurisdiction, but bishops will be the auxiliary of the superior general to perform the ordinations and the confirmation. That's what he did in June 30, 1988. And of course, there was great disobedience. He was accused of having fostered a schism. And Pope John Paul II said, you know, at the root of this quote-unquote schismatic act, there is a false, incomplete, and contradictory notion of tradition. So that's the fundamental reason why, Arch why John Paul II condemned Archbishop Lefebvre we're back to the notion of tradition. According to John Paul II, tradition is something living. It has to move on. We cannot stay stuck in the past. Archbishop Lefebvre says we, for himself, tradition is what the church has taught for 2,000 years. And we're back to that conflict, the church of today against the church of yesterday. And the conflict of obedience, conflict of authority. And uh, as St. Vincent de Lerins said, you know, if there's a time of confusion, go back to the past, because that does not change. And that's what Archbishop Lefebvre did. And the Archbishop Lefebvre always claimed that the excommunication was invalid on that ground, that, first of all, it rejected the case of necessity. One has to be blind to reject the reality of a, a major crisis in the church today. And one has to be really blind and want to be blind 
the closing of seminaries, the drop of vocation, the loss of faith in Europe, the scandal among the clergy, all, all these things, the church being emptied for sale. I mean, Cardinal Ratzinger in 84 wrote the famous Ratzinger report to show there's a problem in the church. Major. Absolutely major. So there is a crisis. And in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI lifted the excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre and the four bishops without asking anything in counterpart, which meant discreetly that the reasons Archbishop Lefebvre performed consecration of bishops were valid reasons. There's a need for priests. There's a need for the sacraments around the world. So, to uh, close with this, the question of obedience is coming back frequently again in different ways. But we have to remember this, okay? There's authority and there's obedience. And the one who is asking something, he is himself under other higher authorities. And he has to, he, he's accountable for this. And therefore, the one who is under, the one who is bound to obedience, has to also, has to see, well, we have to save our soul. If somebody asking ask me something which is against the tradition of the church, I say, respectfully, I say, Your Excellency, Your Grace, or Your Holiness, this, I'm sorry, I cannot do. Yes, um, for, for example, communion to, to the divorcee remarry that Pope Francis is encouraging with Homoris Laetitia. We say, well, it, it is, we would say, according to what we have said, it is an abuse of authority. Why? The Pope cannot say, all of a sudden, adultery is no longer a mortal sin. He's not the one who made that law. It's in Scripture that adultery, I mean, uh, will not go to heaven. And also that in order to receive Holy Communion, one has to be in, in good standing with Almighty God. And these married and uh, divorced, remarried, are not in good standing before God. It's the sixth commandment, and that comes from God. So even a pope can misuse his uh, authority. So the difficulty is obviously to keep re his respect towards him. But Saint Robert Bellarmine, who you know, who says that we still we can resist, just as it is licit to resist a pontiff that attacks the body, it is also licit to resist one who attacks the soul who, or who disturbs the civil order or, above all, one who intends to destroy the church. I say it is licit to resist by not doing what he orders and by impeding the execution of that which he wills. Very strong words. And Robert Bellamy is the doctor of the church. So, obedience is... Uh, as I'm repeating a number of times, it's an important virtue, it's a delicate virtue. One has to see the authority of the one giving us the order. One has to see the, the lawfulness of the order. And, and one has to, and when we have the guidance of 2,000 years, that's our benefit of having the church, 2,000 years, the councils and the teaching of 20, 20 councils, to, to guide us on the straight and narrow path that leads to heaven. Archbishop Lefebvre has proven, even 25 years after his death, he has proven that the principles that he has used in this fight for tradition are very sound and very Catholic. And little by little, even the authorities in the Vatican have to admit this. Pope Benedict XVI has... So, and these are some consideration unobedient. It's a difficult one, but feel free to ask questions whenever you want, and uh, I'll try to answer them when I have time. Thank you very much. Of course, in, in a, a number of our cities all over the world, London, Paris, New York, Montreal, Toronto, there are different traditional masses. And so what to do when we have a choice between different traditional masses. I think the important thing to understand is 
It's not just the mass that is involved here, is, in, is concerned. It's the faith. The mass is, conveys the faith. And uh, you can have the traditional mass, but in a, in a Novus Ordo setting, with, with the new mass in between, you can have a traditional mass. I ha I've seen this in India, where in Bombay, in India, where the priest was asked by the bishop, an old Jesuit, I think it was Jesuit, to say the traditional mass in a parish in Bandra, in Bombay. And he himself told us, we met him because we say, oh, it must be good. He said the traditional mass. And we went to see him. And he told us, I don't believe in his traditional mass. I said because the bishop asked me to do it. But his sermon, in his sermons, he was saying, why do you, why do you insist so much in having this mass? So the sermons were against the traditional mass, although he was saying the traditional mass. There's the issue of, so there's the issue of the sermons. There's the issue of, of uh, some, in some churches, some churches they have exclusively the traditional mass, like the indult mass or different groups. Some churches they share with the Novus Ordo. Uh, you have this mix of Novus Ordo and traditional, which is really unhealthy because it makes both acceptable. And uh, the new mass is Colonel Taviani who said is, departs in a striking manner from the Catholic theology of the Mass, as defined by the Council of Trent. So, uh, there's more than the Mass. There's the sermon. There's also the consecration, the communion. Will the priest in the traditional Mass take the ciborium consecrated in the Novus Ordo, from the tabernacle? Or if there's not enough host, will he go and get the other host? Or There's, uh, there's the... Uh, I know this group, the, the Good Shepherd Institute in France, some priests who left SSPX, they started another group to be approved by the local bishop. And, and they had exclusive use of a church for the traditional mass. Okay? But they had to put in the porch of their church all the posters that were in all the parishes in the diocese, charismatic meetings, this or the collection they're going to have a collection for this or that humanitarian organization or whatever they have to advertise all these things and some of these organizations are promoting abortion and whatever we have an issue here in canada so uh so you see there's more there's the and and another thing even if the sermon is very catechetical you might say very often in those who are approved to have the traditional mass, they cannot speak against the problems happening now. And the most recent is the, the famous Correctio Filialis of, with that uh, 62 scholars wrote to Pope Francis. Now there are 250 who have signed this, this petition. I mean, pointing out to the Holy Father that seven of his propositions of his interpretation of Amoris Laetitia are heretical. Clearly against a dogma of the faith. Such as uh, you can be living in adultery, sleeping with your concubine, and be in a state of grace. If that's written clearly. Or that our Lord Jesus Christ wants the church to change the teaching on marriage. Pope Francis is promoting this. So, so the problem is those who are approved in having churches and uh, having the traditional mass, and the mass in itself is the mass, granted, but they will not be enlightening, they will not be instructing their faithful on the present errors. So there's, there's a culpable silence on major errors. That are happening. Is adultery a mortal sin? Is there still Ten Commandments or only nine? Or not nine, because if you accept adultery, you have to remove the ninth one as well. So there's eight. And the fourth one, because what about your obligation with your wife? And the fifth one, because if, what about your scandal to your children? So that's already, you know, we're down to four. You practically have to remove all the commandments. There's nothing left. So 
And the problem is those who want to be approved to have the traditional mass, they, they cannot speak out because the fear of losing what they have. And then the question we ask is, well, should we obey men rather than God or God rather than men? And if I cannot, if I'm told by my superior, I'm not allowed to say adultery is a mortal sin, I say, well, you don't have the right to tell me this. God gave us the commandments. We have to preach the commandment. So I have to preach it. So uh, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes it can be very difficult. But I encourage those who are concerned to look at the whole picture. And, uh, and it's, the whole picture is not healthy. That's for sure. The whole picture is not healthy.